Hi again. In this video, we will add the left paddle or player. For that, we will configure the input file. We'll add a game object to our collection and then we'll attach a script to that game object where we will implement the paddles movement logic. Okay, let's get started. Let's go ahead and add some bindings. For the keys, we will use to move the left paddle. For that, we will open the input file and we'll be adding some rows to the key triggers. First one, we'll be using the W key to move the paddle up, the left paddle. So let's go ahead and look for the W key. There we go. The action we'll be using would be left underscore up. Like you can choose anything you would like. This is what we'll be using for now. And let's add one for the down movement. So this time we'll be using the S key. Look for it, there we go. And the action will be left on this go down. Let's make sure to save the file. Okay, with our input ready, let's add a game object to our collection. So let's go ahead and open the main collection. Let's add a game object. You can either right click or just hit the A key as I just did. We'll call this left underscore paddle. Next, we'll be adding a sprite. So you can either right click and add component or hit the A button again. We're gonna choose the sprite. And just like we did with a background, we're gonna choose our atlas. And we're gonna be using the paddle. Okay, let's set the game object's position. Remember the game object, not the sprites. Be careful, this is important uh, in this scenario because we're gonna be moving the left paddle. Uh, so it's gonna look weird if we set the sprite to a different position. We're going to be setting the x-axis to 128, just to give it some margin. And we're going to be using 320 for the y position, for the y-axis. And if you notice, we can't see the sprite. We can't see the game object. And that's because both the background and the left paddle have the same set position. So let's set this to 0 0.5. Anything above 0 would work. Just be careful not to set it above one because there's something called visible planes in default. And by default, they are set to one and minus one. So for example, if we were set, we were to set it to 1.5, if we run the game, we're still not gonna see the game object, right? We can see it here, but we're not gonna see it in game. So that's why we're choosing something between zero and one. And there we go. We can see the left paddle. Awesome. With our game object in place, let's implement the movement logic. So we'll start by creating a folder called, we're going to call it scripts. That's new folder. Scripts. Just be mindful to create it inside the main folder. And inside scripts, we're going to create a script <laughs> and we'll call it left underscore paddle whoops so underscore there and there we go if this is your first time using default you'll notice that there's a bunch of lifecycle functions added here already by default and well for this script we're going to be using just two of these we'll only be using the init and uh, on input function. So let's go ahead and delete the others. There we go. We're gonna be deleting the comments soon as well. Now let's start by adding some constants for the actions we created in the input file. So we'll just call them left up. And these are of type hash, which we'll discuss in a bit. And let's do the same for the down movement. Okay, so a few things here. Uh, first of all, we're using local. Uh, so if you're new to Lua, every, in Lua, everything by default is global. So because it's, it's a scripting language, um, you actually get to use anything that you declare in a script will be available in other scripts. But uh, however, we don't want that. 
we are going to be usually scoping things on a per script basis. That's why most of our variables and functions, custom functions, functions we create are going to be local just so otherwise we might end up like in a very messy scenario where we're calling functions from another script without realizing it, for example, or same with variables. The other thing you might notice are the hashes. This is just a type a default uses for message passing because of uh, some uniqueness in, in Lua when it comes to strings. We use hashes to avoid issues. Okay, next we're gonna be adding one more constant and this is going to be for the object speed. So let's go ahead and declare a local variable called object speed and we're gonna be using five. Feel free to tweak it to your liking. We're gonna, we're gonna stick to five for now. We'll see how it feels. Okay, so in default game objects don't receive input by default. We have to send a message to acquire input focus, what's called input focus in, in default. Uh, we send the message to the game object itself. This will make the game object receive the actions we configured in the input file. So whenever we click W or S on the input function, we're going to be using uh, those methods. And I just realized I actually deleted the on input function. So let's add it back in. Um, that's my bad. So in here it's an action ID and an action and everything else should be okay. So let's continue with the message passing. So if it's not clear, um, I'm going to leave a link in the description below for how Devil handles input. If you want to do some reading, how we send the message to the game object itself is through the receiver of a dot that sends a message to the game object itself, not the component. So if we go to the collection, Sprite would be a component of the left paddle game object. So we're sending a message to the game object itself. And the message we're gonna be sending is acquire underscore input focus. And I'm not great at typing right now, but there we go. So like this, we're telling the game object that it should listen to input. We're gonna be discussing message passing further in a different tutorial. For now, just know that whenever we need to handle input. And now let's go ahead and start implementing the actual logic. So we'll actually we do that in the input function. So the logic that we're gonna be implementing is gonna go like this. We're gonna get the object position, the game object's position. We're gonna check which action is the one that we're receiving. And once we know what the action is, we'll update the Y position. The paddle is only gonna be moving on the Y position. So the X is gonna stay constant. And then at the very end, we're gonna just update the position of the game object. And that's how we're gonna be handling the movement in this video. So let's go ahead and implement that. The way we get a game object's position in default is through the go dot get position method. So as you can see, there was an ID parameter that's optional. That's because if you want to get the position of a different object, you can specify the ID of that game object. But if you don't, then you'll get the position of the current game object or the game object that the sprite is in. That, sorry, the script is in. And this go pre prefix is, is game object basically. Okay, so with the position in place, now we are going to check the action. Let's check what action, let's go ahead. So if action ID is how we receive the action from the input is, so we're gonna be using the constant and start with the up. So if it's left up, then we need to update the Y position Sorry, the y-axis of the neck of the position. And what we're gonna do is we are going to add the speed of the object that we set above. So let's do that. So we need to add it to the next position. So y-axis, so the, to the previous position, we add the speed, and that's how we get the movement of the object. Right? Now we've got another, so let's see what else if here. 
So we have action ID, let's go ahead and just copy this. Right, so if it's the down action, instead of adding it, we just subtract it. Okay, and with this, we have movement. Just note that we're not changing the x-axis at all. We're, gonna re we're relying on the x-axis of the editor, so that's why it's important to set it, because we're not updating any code. So, okay, and last, what we need to do is to update the game object's position. So pretty much how we get it, how we got the position in the first place, go dot set position. Yeah, and then we give it the next position we've already calculated. And there we go. So now let's go ahead and try this. Hit the W and the S, and it does not seem to be working. Oh, right, of course. So we haven't added the script to the game object. I always do that. So let's go back to the collection. Uh, left battle, of course, we haven't attached the script, so nothing's happening. That's how we add the script. So let me do that again. Did it a bit too quickly. So you add a component file. This is how we add scripts to the game objects. We right click component file and there we go. It's, it's one, it, it's now a component of the game object of the left part of the game object. And this is how we attach scripts and how we run them. So let's go ahead and try this again. Yeah, and it's working. Awesome. However, there, there, there's just one last problem. So let me show that to you. There we go. So the paddles actually leave in the screen, which it really shouldn't do. It should stay within the screen bounds. So yeah, let's go ahead and fix this. So a simple solution, and that's the one that we're going to be using, is to use the min and max math functions that we have available through the standard library. And this way we can make sure that the paddles y-axis doesn't exceed the screen bound. For that, we will need the screen's height. We need to know what the screen's height is. And we'll, we'll also need the sprite height. If it's not clear why at this point, don't worry, it will become clear in a sec. I'm gonna explain it, uh, but let's just add it for now. Uh, as a hint, it has to do with the object's pivot point being in the center of the game object. We've discussed this uh, in the previous video, uh, but let's go ahead and, and, and show what I'm talking about. So for the screen's height, we're gonna set it here. Let's go ahead and call it our game's height. So what we'll do is we're gonna get the setting from the display option. Remember we configured this in one of the earlier videos. So we'll do that through sys.getconfig is how we get the config from the game game.project file. The key here it's the display group and then Height. This will give us the height of the, the display that we set in one of the earlier videos. Now there's just one more thing. So this says look at config will give you a string. So what we need to do is just cast this to a number and then we will be able to use it correctly. As we said, we also need the object height. So let's initialize it. and we need to get the property of a sprite. So how we do this is we use the game object library and get. This get will give us, so you specify the URL of the component that you're getting the property from, and then you specify the property. So for the URL, we're gonna be using hashtag sprite. And the way that you can get URLs with, we discussed this in the, background, but just you can just come like click here in the component itself and go to the URL. So if you notice, we're not using like the fully named uh, URL. We're not using the full URL. We're just using hashtag sprite. So what that does is by default, it looks for a sprite component in the current game object. That's how we refer to it. Next, um, the property. We're gonna be getting the size.y property and we won't be using any options right here. Now let's make sure the y-axis never exceeds the screen's height when moving up. I'm not gonna use the sprite height just yet so it's clear why we need it. So let's go ahead and just, we'll choose the smallest of two things. 
either it's the next position plus the speed or it's going to be the screen's height, the game's height. So let's go ahead and set this to game height. And let's go ahead and test it. Yeah, and there we go. It's not, it's not going to go above this point, but maybe you can see why we also need the object height because otherwise half of, this, of the paddle is going above screen. Remember, this is because, let's go ahead to the main collection. And if we look at the component, let's choose this. The pivot point here is in the center of the object. So if we set the game object's position to the screen height, this the center, the middle of the paddle is what's actually going to go there. So that's why we need to take into account the object's height when calculating this. So let's go back and we need to subtract the, the object height Well, half of the object height, right? Because we only need to take into account half of it. So let's go ahead and test it. And there we go. Now it's not leaving the screen bounds. So let's go ahead and do the same thing for the down movement. This will take the greatest value. It's pretty similar, but in here, because it's zero, all we need to take into account, so zero is, are the, is the lower bound, so all we need to take into account is half of the sprites. So that's the lowest position, basically. That's what we're saying. The lowest position is half of the game object's height. So let's test this down. And yeah, there we go. Now the paddle's not leaving the screen. Awesome. Now, now we're making good progress with the game. This is one of the great things about default. It's quite simple to implement all these things. It provides so many tools and it itself it's it's quite quite simple at least you know, compared to other game engines that are, that I've used like I don't know Unity or Unreal for example. Well, and that's it for the video. I, I really do hope you're enjoying the series. Uh, if you have any feedback, please leave a comment below and we'll make sure to read it and and act on the feedback. Uh, we're only starting, so it's greatly appreciated. See you in the next one.